Hello everyone and welcome back to the Dungeon Learner's Guide. Today we have another Commander's Guild deck tech. This is our 47th deck and it's titled Technically Not Zombie Tribal. And if you haven't seen this show before, what we are doing is randomly selecting a card from scryfall.com, working with a budget of $100 or less, and building a deck for Magic the Gathering, specifically the Commander format, around a theme of the chosen card. So. Before we jump into the actual deck itself, I do want to very quickly highlight some of our social media accounts. If you are interested, you can follow us on Twitter, find us on Reddit, send us an email at dungeonlearnersguide at gmail.com. You can also, if you're interested in purchasing any cards through TCG Player, you can use our affiliate code and our affiliate link, which will be very useful and helpful to the channel, and we get a little bit of support from them. So if you're interested in buying cards, I would very much appreciate it if you used our link. And then finally, if you're interested in supporting us directly, you can always go over to Patreon. We do have several tiers available where you can get early access to our deck techs, participate in some of the games, and also get a little bit of input on the deck lists themselves, and maybe even work our way up to sending out some of our random cards every month. So any of these are greatly appreciated, and of course, if none of them are quite your thing, you can always like the video and subscribe. That really does help out a lot, helps us grow the channel, and I appreciate that quite a bit. So thank you everybody for watching, and without any further ado, I suppose it's time we get into our random card of the week. And this week, we have a suggested card by Greg Lockton on YouTube, and that card is Gissa and Garalf. It is a 2 blue black for a legendary creature human wizard, 4-4. Four, four. When Gissa and Garalf enters the battlefield, you mill 4 cards, and then during each of your turns, you may cast a zombie creature spell from your graveyard. So, as always, if you've seen this before, if we have a random card of the week that is a legendary, that means that of course, our commander has to be that card. We gotta build around it to the best of our abilities. So, when I first saw this card, and I think what most people see when they first see this card, is that it works for zombie tribal decks. You want to put your own zombies in the graveyard, you want to cast them, kind of keep recurring your zombies as you go, but I started thinking about it and I realized I didn't actually want to build a zombie tribal deck. I wanted to try to find something else to do with Gissa and Garolf, and I think I may have succeeded, and I'll kind of explain that a little bit later. But first, let's take a look at some themes and see if you can kind of piece together what we're trying to do. So first up for our themes, we want to be able to mill our opponents, but more importantly, we want to be able to mill ourselves. Since Gissa and Garolf allows us to cast zombies from the graveyard, we want things in our graveyard. So a good example of that is King Narfi's Betrayal, which is a saga. It's one blue and a black. And at the first lore counter, each player mills four cards. Then you may exile a creature or planeswalker card from each graveyard. Then at two and three, until end of turn, you may cast spells from among cards exiled with King Narfi's Betrayal, and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast those spells. So we can exile our opponent's things and cast it, we can exile our own things and cast it, but the important part here is that it does exactly what our commander does, it mills four cards, but it does it a turn earlier. So this is incredibly useful and is a great example of what we want to be doing. We want to be putting cards in our graveyard and hopefully casting those cards. So with that in mind, let's take a look at our second theme, which is actually going to be bounce or flicker or exile effects. We want some way to be able to take advantage of Gissa and Garolf's ability. Because the way that it's worded, Gissa and Garolf says that we can only cast one card out of our graveyard a turn. But if we make a new Gissa and Garolf, so for example we exile it and return it to the battlefield, it doesn't know that we've cast a spell from our graveyard this turn and will let us do it again. So we are able to cast Displace, for example, which is two and a blue for an instant, exile up to two target creatures you control, then return those cards to the battlefield under their owner's control. So we are able to flicker Gissa and Garolf maybe two, three times, get a ton of milling, but also cast multiple cards out of our graveyard every single time we do it. 
And because of that, we did add in some more cards that have enter the battlefield effects. So we do have ways to take advantage of displace, kind of letting us rebuy our enter the battlefield effects. Things like Mall Drifter, being able to draw cards when it enters, that kind of thing. So we do have a small sub theme of enter the battlefield triggers to kind of go along with displace. And then finally, our last major theme of the deck are going to be cards that want to be in our graveyard. Because if we're milling so many cards, we need things in our graveyard to actually do things with. And to that end, one of our all-stars for this deck is Master of Death, which is one blue and a black for a zombie wizard, which could be relevant because Gis and Grolf does let us cast zombies out of our graveyard, even though we are, and I will state this again, technically not zombie tribal. Master of Death is a 3-1 that when it enters the battlefield, you surveil two, so you're able to look at the top two cards of your deck, put any number into your graveyard, and return any number on top, so we can again kind of put more cards into our graveyard if we want to. And at the beginning of our upkeep, if Master of Death is in our graveyard, we may pay one life and return it to our hand. So we can put it on the battlefield, maybe sacrifice it, maybe use it to block, maybe just kind of get it killed somehow. And then bring it back to our hand, letting us surveil again. So we're able to kind of keep rebuying this ability. And because it does have an enter the battlefield ability, that also works super well with displace. And it works well with our milling ability. So that's really what this deck is trying to do. We want to mill, we want to blink, and we want to have some cards that care about the graveyard. So those are our main themes for this week. But themes aren't quite enough to get a deck running. We also need some key cards, some cards that really help our synergies come together. And out of those cards, the first one is going to be Gravebreaker Lamia. So four and a black for a four, four enchantment creature, Snake Lamia has lifelink. And when Gravebreaker Lamia enters the battlefield, search your library for a card, put it into your graveyard, then shuffle your library. Spells you cast from your graveyard cost one less to cast. So most tutors in the commander format, cards that let you search up cards out of your deck and put them into your hand or into your graveyard or whatever, tend to be pretty expensive. Luckily, Gravebreaker Lamia is five mana, so it's on the higher end of mana value for tutors. Most want to be around like two to three to four, but it's only 38 cents. So really it does perfectly for our budget deck. And it has an enter the battlefield trigger. So if we are able to blink it, to exile it, bring it back, we can search for more and more cards. And then spells we cast from our graveyard cost one less, which is just a phenomenal ability in this deck. And finally, we have Gissa and Garolf. We're able to cast cards out of our graveyard. So putting it into our graveyard when we're tutoring for something is not a bad thing. Really, that's exactly what we want to be doing. In this deck, our graveyard is very much just an extension of our hand. So putting it into our graveyard, just as good as putting it into our hand. And Graveyard Lamia, definitely an all-star in this deck. So next up, our second key card is going to be Altar of Dementia, which is one of the more expensive cards in the deck, but surprisingly, not the most expensive. And it's at $8.87, and you'll see why in just a minute. Altar of Dementia, two mana for an artifact, Sacrifice a creature. Target player puts a number of cards equal to the sacrificed creature's power from the top of their library into their graveyard. So you mill equal to the creature's power. This is exactly what we want to be doing. It's able to kill off our own creatures, put them into the graveyard, so we can recast them with Gissa and Garolf. And it's milling us for more. So for example, if we use Gravebreaker Lamia, we cast it, we put something into our graveyard, we kill it off with Altar of Dementia, mill ourselves for four more, and then there's a chance we're able to recast it, put it back into play, and repeat the process again. So Altar of Dementia can really be an engine in this deck, and it can be super useful if we need it, but it's also just a great value piece for everything we're really trying to do. And finally, that brings us to our last key card of the deck. And in this case, it is Grey Merchant of Asphodel. You can't talk about a, a Blink deck that includes black without talking about Grey Merchant of Asphodel. He is three black black for a 2-4 zombie. When Grey Merchant of Asphodel enters the battlefield, 
each opponent loses x life where x is your devotion to black and you gain life equal to the life lost this way so if we have no other permanents on board three opponents it comes in drains each opponent for two and then we gain six so that is incredibly powerful when we have ways to buy it back we can recast it out of our graveyard with gissa and Karolf, and we're able to exile it blink it do all these things that we need to do to get it to enter the battlefield as many times as possible and obviously we have more black cards in our deck than just gray merchant so there's a good chance we'll be draining for a lot more than two every time it enters so more than any other card in this deck i do think gray merchant is the win condition um it's definitely one you want to protect if you can but it's not the only win condition so don't let that freak you out but it is very very powerful because it kills our opponents and it keeps us alive so it does exactly what we're trying to do making it a very good key card for this deck so now that we've talked a little bit about our themes we've talked about our key cards i'm gonna take a look at some cool interactions in this deck some cards that work very well together and this is where we get to the part where i kind of explain why we are not technically zombie tribal and it's gonna be a bit of a journey so bear with me but we're gonna start with two specific cards and that is rooftop storm and conspiracy so rooftop storm is five and a blue for an enchantment that says you may pay zero rather than pay the mana cost for zombie creature spells you cast that would be super great in a zombie tribal deck but as we've mentioned we're not a zombie tribal deck we do have some zombies but that's not our main focus however if we pair that up with conspiracy which is three black black for an enchantment as conspiracy comes into play choose a creature type creature cards you own that aren't in play creature spells you control and creatures you control are the chosen type so we can cast Conspiracy, name Zombie, making every single creature in our deck a zombie, whether they're in our hand, in our graveyard, in our library, in our command zone, every single creature in our entire deck is now a zombie, meaning that we can use Rooftop Storm to cast those cards for free, making every single creature in our deck zero mana. Now, that doesn't seem especially powerful, but again, we have a ton of Enter the Battlefield triggers, we have a ton of milling, and we have Gisa and Garolf, which can cast a zombie from our graveyard every single turn. We are now being able to pay zero for our zombies, meaning we could cast a Mull Drifter from our graveyard. We can cast the Grey Merchant from our graveyard. We can cast the Gravebreaker Lamia from our graveyard. Any single creature now is completely free, and we can play it from our hand, sacrifice it, play it from our graveyard, and keep the chain going. So while Rooftop Storm is incredibly powerful, the key here is Conspiracy. Obviously, we want to be able to cast cards out of our graveyard for free, but it's more important that we can just cast cards from our graveyard. So that is where we have Conspiracy. We have Arcane Adaptation, which is very similar to in a blue. As Arcane Adaptation enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Creatures you control are the chosen type in addition to their other types. The same is true for creature spells you control and creature cards you own that aren't on the battlefield. If two isn't enough, we still have Maskwood Nexus, which is four mana for an artifact. Creatures you control are every creature type. The same is true for creature spells you control and creature cards you own that aren't on the battlefield. This one also has the additional upside of being able to pay three, tap it, make a two-two shapeshifter. But maybe that's not enough. Maybe we still need more. That's where Ashes of the Fallen comes in. And this is an incredibly unique one. Because as Ashes of the Fallen comes into play, choose a creature type. Each creature card in your graveyard has the chosen creature type in addition to its other types. This one doesn't hit our hand, or our commander, or our library. But it still lets us cast any creature from our graveyard with Gissa and Garolf. So we have tons of backups to be able to do exactly what we want to do with these. And Rooftop Storm is really just like the icing on the cake. It isn't necessary for what we're trying to do, but it sure powers up the combo a lot when we can have Gissa and Garolf, maybe Ashes of the Fallen, and Rooftop Storm. 
Casting any creature from our graveyard for free is incredibly powerful, and I think once this gets online, I feel like it'll be really tough for our opponents to deal with it. So, this is the main combo that really drew me to Gissa and Garalf, not as a zombie tribal deck, but more as a combo deck. So, that's our main cool interaction that I did want to highlight. I won't spend too much more time on this, because... I feel like we've gone over that. But there is another cool interaction I do want to highlight, and that is actually going to be between Lord of the Forsaken and Army of the Damned. So we've talked a little bit about wanting to mill ourselves for some cards, and we've talked about cards that want other things in the graveyard. So if we can combine Lord of the Forsaken, which is four black black for a 6-6 six, six demon with flying, trample, you can pay a black, sacrifice another creature, and target player mills three cards. And then you can pay one life and add a colorless mana, but spend this mana only to cast a spell from your graveyard. So what we can do is compare that with Army of the Damned, which is five black, 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 for a sorcery that says create 13 tapped 2-2 two, two black zombie creature tokens, and it has flashback for seven black, black, black. Now, what we can do is cast Army of the Damned. We make 13 tutus. If we need to mill someone out, we can then start sacrificing the tutus to Lord of the Forsaken, maybe milling ourselves, milling our opponents. But the key here is if we pay 7 life, then Army of the Damned becomes 8 mana to cast and then 3 to flash back, meaning that for 11 total mana plus 7 life, we get 26 tapped 2-2 two, two zombies. And at that point, we might have enough to start milling our opponents out with like Altar of Dementia. We have ways of attacking, obviously, if we can survive. We can hold up counter magic, things like that. So Lord of the Forsaken and Army of the Damned can be incredibly powerful because they just work so well together. They do exactly what the other card wants. One wants to be cast out of the graveyard, one wants to do the casting out of the graveyard, one wants to make creatures, one wants to sacrifice creatures. Really, they are just perfectly matched for each other, and I'm very happy that I found this interaction in the deck. I am hoping that we get to pull it off at some point, but we'll see. So, those are the cool interactions for the deck. And the last piece of the actual deck tech itself is we got to take a look at the price. Now, the price for this deck wound up being $91.28. And as we mentioned earlier, Altar of Dementia was a very expensive card, but not the most expensive card, even though it was nearly $9. The actual most expensive card in the deck goes to Deadeye Navigator, which narrowly beats out Altar of Dementia by about three cents. And Deadeye Navigator is four blue blue for a spirit, five five with soul bond. So you may pair this creature with another unpaired creature when either enters the battlefield, and they remain paired for as long as you control both of them. As long as Deadeye Navigator is paired with another creature, each of those creatures has one in a blue, exile this creature, then return it to the battlefield under your control. So Deadeye Navigator is incredibly powerful in this deck because it's allowing us to, for two mana, blink any creature we control. So if we have 10 mana, we could blink a single creature five times. That means with Gissa and Garolf, we're milling ourselves for 20, maybe being able to cast some creatures out of our graveyard for free every single time we do it. We could blink Muldrifter five times and draw 10 cards. We could blink Grey Merchant and drain all of our opponents for 10 life, meaning that we would gain a total of 30 life. This can be incredibly powerful in a blink deck, and so our deck, wanting to blink some things, is no exception to that rule. Now, if you are looking to cut down on the price of this deck, as we've mentioned, Deadeye and Altar of Dementia are both close to $9 each, so... If you wind up cutting both of them, you're looking at bringing the price down by almost $20 and getting this close to about $73, $74 for the entire deck, which is definitely much more manageable than $91. But if you have these cards and are interested in putting them in, then I do think they would be very powerful and very useful to, to keep around if you're able to. But maybe you're even looking to up the price of the deck. And if that's the case, I do have some out-of-budget upgrades I can suggest. The first of which, Necro-Duality. 
Necro Duality is 3 and a blue for an enchantment. Whenever a non-token zombie enters the battlefield under your control, create a token that's a copy of that creature. Now again, we're not zombie tribal. But we do have the enchantments and the artifacts that make all of our creatures zombies. So we could cast a zombie, which is maybe not a zombie, and then make two versions of it. Make it and a copy. And so we kill off the original, we bring it back with Gis and Grolf, make another one. Because the key here is that it just has to enter the battlefield. It does not have to be cast. So all of our blinking shenanigans, being able to exile it, bring it back, still triggers necro duality. So all we have to do is get any zombie online, which may not even be a zombie if we have something like arcane adaptation, and just keep making token copies, keep getting into the battlefield triggers, keep casting things out of our graveyard. Necro duality, phenomenal card for what this deck wants to do. But it is, of course, $17.66, so it is a difficult card to try to find a spot for. And if that's not quite enough, we do still have one more out-of-budget upgrade, and this one is Liliana Heretical Healer. So, a little bit cheaper than Necro Duality, $13.19, since it recently got reprinted, Commander Collection Black. But Liliana says... Well, I guess we should start with the mana cost. Liliana costs one black black. She's a human cleric, two three with lifelink. Whenever another non-token creature you control dies, exile Liliana, heretical healer, then return her to the battlefield transformed under her owner's control. If you do, create a two two black zombie creature token. Then, when she transforms, she becomes Liliana, defiant necromancer, which is three loyalty planeswalker, she can plus two, each player discards a card, minus X, return target non-legendary creature card with mana value X from your graveyard to the battlefield, and minus eight, you get an emblem with whenever a creature dies, return it to the battlefield under your control at the beginning of the next end step. That is a lot of abilities, but Liliana is very powerful for what we're trying to do. We would love it if each player discards a card, because that means we get to put more things into our graveyard. Minus X, we get to reanimate cards out of our graveyard, which is, again, just what we're looking to do. And if we're ever lucky enough to get that minus 8, being able to just immediately return cards to the battlefield when they die every single turn, at that point, it's going to be incredibly hard to for our opponents to win because there's not going to be much they can really do. We're going to kill off our creatures, but they just come back. And we are always going to have sacrifice outlets, so even if they try to exile stuff, it's really not going to work. So Liliana, definitely a good upgrade for this deck if you happen to have one, or maybe if you bought the new Commander Collection. But those are our two out-of-budget upgrades for this week. So the very last thing we have to do with this deck is jump into a game. Now, for the first time, though, we are actually going to have two different gameplay videos for this one deck. Because I played a couple of games with this deck, well, I only played the two, but a two is a couple. And I realized that both of them were pretty short. I would be able to probably edit both of them in time for the video. And I decided to give it a shot, and I was successful. So the first video that we're going to show, the first game, is actually only a three-player game. We had a fourth, but unfortunately they had to cancel due to some internet issues. So instead, we are simply joined by George, who is playing his Millicent Restless Revenant deck, which is an upgraded pre-con. So there's going to be some spirits. It's going to be very tribal-centered. Probably a lot of flying, which is not quite that good for us. And then our second opponent is going to be Mike, who is playing his Alesha Who Smiles at Death deck. So... I've played against Mike's deck before, I have not played against George's, but Mike's Alesha deck is very powerful, it can be very fast, uh, it's definitely very graveyard-centered, very combo-centered, so I do think that in the short term, Alesha is probably the bigger threat, but I think if the game goes long, I think Millicent becomes the threat with the ability to kind of control things with blue and white, and then also just the massive spirits that I imagine are going to be there, so... I'm interested to see how this game goes. I hope you guys enjoy it. And of course, stick around because we will have one more game after this one, which is a full four-player game. So I'm also very excited for that. So enjoy the game, and I will talk to you all once it's done. At the start of the first game, George goes first 
followed by myself, and then Mike. On George's first turn, he plays a Plains and passes. I play a Choked Estuary, tapped and pass. Mike plays a Mountain and passes. George plays a Nimbus Maze and then casts Spectral Sailor, which can be activated for four mana to draw a card. On my turn, I play a Swamp. On Mike's turn, he also plays a Swamp and then casts Rick's Mahdi Reveler, discarding a Rugged Prairie to draw a card when it enters the battlefield. George plays a Plains, and then casts Nebelgast Herald, allowing him to tap a creature whenever a spirit enters the battlefield under his control, using this instance to tap the Reveler. He then moves to combat and attacks me for one with the Sailor. On my turn, I play an Island, and then cast a Commander's Sphere. Mike plays a Bloodstained Mire, sacrificing it to search his deck and put a Sacred Foundry into play untapped, losing two life. He then casts his Commander, Alesha who smiles at death, before moving to combat and attacking George for two. George plays a Plains, and then attacks Mike for two, and me for one, and then passes. I play a Terramorphic Expanse, and then cast my commander Gisa and Garolf, milling the top four cards of my library and gaining the ability to cast a zombie from my graveyard once a turn. Once that resolves, I sacrifice Terramorphic Expanse to put a basic land into play tapped. Mike plays a Swamp, and then casts Viscera Seer, which can sacrifice a creature to scry one, and moves to combat, attacking George for three with Alesha, and me for two with the Reveler. Before blocks, however, George decides to cast Benevolent Offering, choosing me as his opponent, so we both make three 1-1 one -one spirit tokens with flying, but we accidentally forget about the life gain part of the card. Once that resolves, but still before blocks, Mike casts Fire Covenant, paying 12 life to do 12 damage divided as he chooses, which allows him to kill all creatures he doesn't control. Then damage happens and George takes 3, while I take 2. On George's turn, he casts Breath of the Sleepless, allowing him to cast spirits at flash speed and tap down creatures if he plays a creature on an opponent's turn. I play a Swamp, and then recast my commander, Kisa and Garolf, milling another four cards. Then, at the end of turn, Mike sacrifices his Rixmati Reveler to scry one with the Viscera Seer. On his turn, Mike plays a Phyrexian Tower, which lets him sacrifice a creature to create two black mana. He then moves to combat, attacking George for four, activating Alesha on the attacks to return Rixmati Reveler to play, tapped and attacking, doing another 2 to George, and also allowing him to discard a Plains and draw a card. In his second main phase, he cast Wishclaw Talisman, which comes in with 3 counters and can be activated to remove a counter, search your library for a card, put it to hand, and then give the Talisman to an opponent. On George's turn, he casts a Soul Ring, and then casts Supreme Verdict, destroying all creatures. In response, Mike sacrifices all three of his creatures to scry one three separate times with the Viscera Seer. Then the board wipe resolves, and notably, Mike lets Alesha go to the graveyard, not the command zone. On my turn, I play a Bajuka Bog, exiling Mike's graveyard, and since this exiles Alesha, he moves her to the command zone. I then decide to cast Champion of Wits, drawing two cards and discarding two cards, including a Siphon Insight and a Memory Deluge, which both have flashback. After that, I cast a Liquid Metal Torque and pass. On Mike's turn, he plays a Swamp and casts Reanimate to put my River Kelpie from my graveyard into play under his control, losing 5 life since it's mana value 5, and also drawing a card with River Kelpie's own ability. He then casts a Chrome Mox, exiling Mythos of Snapdax to it so that he can cast it for white mana. 
On George's turn, he casts a Smothering Tithe, allowing him to make a treasure token every time his opponents draw a card, unless that opponent pays two mana. When I draw for my turn, George creates a treasure token, and then I cast Secrets of the Dead, drawing a card whenever I cast a spell from my graveyard. I pass, but at the end of my turn, Mike casts Ad Nauseam, revealing the top card of his library, putting that card into his hand, and then losing life equal to its casting cost. Then he may repeat that process as many times as he wants. This has him revealing Mire Triton, taking 2, A Plains, taking 0, Master of Cruelties, taking 5, Skyclave Apparition, taking 3, and finally, Blasphemous Act, taking 9, knocking himself out of the game. On George's turn, he casts his commander, Millicent Restless Revenant, allowing him to create a 1-1 spirit token whenever his non-token spirits die or deal combat damage to a player. At the end of turn, I flash back Siphon Insight to look at the top two cards of George's library, choosing to exhale Arcane Signet, being able to cast it at any time. This also triggers Secrets of the Dead, drawing me a card, but I pay two so George doesn't make a treasure. When I draw for my turn though, I don't pay the mana, allowing George to create a treasure token, and then I cast George's Arcane Signet. On George's turn, he plays an island, and then casts Storm of Souls, returning all creatures from his graveyard to the battlefield, except now they're 1-1 one, one spirits. This returns Spectral Sailor and Nebelgast Herald to play, tapping down my Champion of Wits. He then moves to combat, attacking me for 4 with Millicent. At the end of turn, I flash back Memory Deluge, looking at the top 7 cards of my library and putting 2 into my hand. This also draws me a card with Secrets of the Dead, and I can't pay for Smothering Tithe, so George creates another treasure. When I draw for my turn, I pay 2 mana for Smothering Tithe, preventing George from making another treasure. Then I play a Dakmore Salvage and cast a Diabolic Tutor, allowing me to search my library for a card and put it into my hand. Once that resolves, I cast a Mind Stone and pass. George plays a Command Tower and casts Mirror Entity, allowing him to give all his creatures base power and toughness X, where X is the amount of mana he pays, tapping down my champion with the Nebelgast Herald. He then activates the entity for 5, making all his creatures into 5-5s, five fives, and moves to combat attacking me for 15 total damage, creating two 1-1 one -one spirits when he deals damage thanks to Millicent. When I draw for my turn, I decide to pay 2 for Smothering Tithe, and then I cast Peregrine Drake, untapping 5 lands when it enters the battlefield. After that, I cast Archaeomancer, allowing me to return an instant or sorcery from my graveyard to my hand. This has me putting Diabolic Tutor back to hand. Then, I cast Displace, exiling Peregrine Drake and Archaeomancer, returning them both to the battlefield and once again untapping 5 lands and returning a spell to my hand, this time being the Displace. With this, I'm able to loop the effects and generate infinite mana. With the infinite mana, I'm able to cast Grey Merchant of Asphodel, draining George for two, and then continuing the loop, this time with Grey Merchant and Archaeomancer, to infinitely drain George out, winning me the game. Alright, so that was game one. We're not going to do the wrap-up quite yet, we'll save that until after game two, but we do still have one more game to play with this deck. And this game is going to be, like I said earlier, a four-player game instead of three. And we are joined by Sean, who is playing his Kumena Tyrant of Arazka deck, Bilal, who is playing Kalia of the Vast, and Jason, who is playing Aura Skyclave Hierophant. So Kumena, Merfolk Tribal, Aura, Cleric Tribal. We've seen both of these decks on the channel before. They are both very fast, being able to gain a ton of life in Aura's case, or just put out a lot of power very quickly in Kumena's case. So... Again, I think early game, Kumena is one to watch out for. Late game, Aura is one to watch out for. But the wild card in this game is Kalia of the Vast. So I know that Bilal's Kalia deck can be very strong. He's got the angels, the demons, the dragons. And really, he wants to be able to drop a ton of power on board very, very quickly. Protect his commander, kind of keep just dropping massive bombs on board. So 
I think that if he's able to keep his commander on board, he's going to be the biggest threat at the table. But I think if we're able to deal with his commander and he has to cast his spells fairly, that might be a different story. So I'm interested to see how this goes. We don't have a ton of removal in this deck. Um, so if Kalia sticks, I'm kind of banking on our opponents to help us out. But we'll see how it goes. And as before, I hope you guys do enjoy the game. And once it's over, we'll be back with the wrap up. At the start of game two, Sean goes first, followed by Bilal, Jason, and then myself. On Sean's first turn, he plays a Simic Guildgate. Bilal plays a Nomad Outpost. Jason plays an Orzov Guildgate. I play a Baron Moor. And on Sean's next turn, he plays an Island, and then cast River Sneak, which is unblockable and gets plus one plus one until end of turn whenever another Merfolk enters the battlefield. Bilal plays a Shine Shadow Snarl, tapped. Jason plays a Command Tower, and then casts a Cleric of Life's Bounty, giving him life whenever a Cleric enters play, and getting a plus one plus one counter the first time he gains life each turn. On my turn, I play a Command Tower. On Sean's turn, he plays an Island, and casts Jungle Born Pioneer, making a 1-1 Merfolk token with Hexproof, and giving River Sneak plus two plus two. He then moves to combat and attacks Jason for three. Bilal plays a Bloodstained Mire, sacrificing it to search his library and put a Sacred Foundry into play untapped, paying two life. He follows that up by casting Fervor, giving all his creatures haste. Jason plays a Shattered Sanctum and casts Righteous Valkyrie, which gains life equal to the toughness of clerics or angels that enter under Jason's control and gives his team plus two plus two if he has 47 or more life. This also triggers Cleric of Life's Bounty, gaining a life and getting a plus one plus one counter. He then attacks Bilal for three. On my turn, I play an Island and once again pass. Sean plays a Forest and casts his commander Kumena, Tyrant of Arazka, giving River Sneak plus one plus one, and then attacks Bilal for two. Bilal plays a Plains and casts his commander Kalia of the Vast. He moves to combat, attacking me with Kalia for two, since she has haste, triggering her ability, and putting Gisela the Broken Blade into play, also attacking me. This ends with me taking six damage and Bilal gaining four life. On Jason's turn, he plays a Plains and casts his own commander, Aura Skyclave Hierophant, gaining four life from his clerics and putting a counter on the Cleric of Life's Bounty, and then attacks me for four. On my turn, I decide to play a high market and then cast my commander, Gissa and Garolf, meaning we all cast our commanders this go around the table, allowing me to cast a zombie from my graveyard once per turn and milling myself for four when it enters. At the end of turn, Sean activates Kumena to tap three Merfolk and draw a card. Then, when he untaps on his turn, he plays an Island and casts Kopala Warden of the Waves, making his opponents pay two more mana to target his Merfolk with any spells or abilities. After that, he casts Coral Helm Commander and then attacks Bilal with River Sneak for three, since two other Merfolk entered the battlefield this turn. Bilal attacks Sean for two with Kalia, triggering her and bringing in Admonition Angel, hitting Sean for an additional six. Then in his second main phase, he plays a Mountain, triggering the Angel, and exiling Kumena until the Angel leaves play. In response, Sean activates Kumena, tapping five Merfolk to put a plus one plus one counter on each of them. On Jason's turn, he plays a Swamp, and then casts a Marauding Blight Priest, which makes each opponent lose a life whenever he gains a life. This triggers both his clerics, gaining him two and then one life, making each opponent lose two total, and then putting a counter on Cleric of Life's Bounty. After that, he casts Eilie Eternal Pilgrim, gaining a total of three life and making each opponent lose two life. 
After that, he moves to combat, attacking Bilal with Aura, who is now a 5-5 thanks to the Righteous Valkyrie, and me for 5 with the Cleric of Life's Bounty, gaining 5 life thanks to Aura's lifelink, making each opponent lose yet another life. On my turn, I cast Memory Deluge, looking at the top 4 cards of my library and putting 2 into my hand. This lets me hit my land drop for the turn, playing an island and passing. Sean recasts his commander Kumena, and then attacks Jason for 3 with River Sneak. Bilal plays a Caves of Koilos, triggering Admonition Angel and exiling Righteous Valkyrie. After that, he casts Scytherix the Blight Dragon, and then moves to combat, attacking Jason with everything except for Scytherix, triggering Kalia, putting Lord of the Void into play, also attacking Jason. This results in Jason taking a total of 19 damage and exiling the top 7 cards of his library, allowing Bilal to put Fiend Hunter into play from among them, exiling Aura until it leaves the battlefield. On Jason's turn, he attacks Sean for 7, and then, in his second main phase, casts Fumigate, destroying all creatures and gaining Jason a life for each creature destroyed this way, gaining a total of 16 life. In response, Sean activates Kumena to tap 3 Merfolk and draw a card. Then the board wipe resolves, returning Aura and Righteous Valkyrie to play when Fiend Hunter and Admonition Angel die. On my turn, I play a Dark Water Catacombs, and then cast Conspiracy naming Zombie to make all my creatures, even the ones not in play, zombies in addition to their other types. Sean plays a Forest, and then casts Lull Mage Mentor, which makes a Merfolk token whenever he casts a spell, and can counter spells by tapping 7 Merfolk, follows that up with Merfolk Skydiver, putting a plus 1 plus 1 counter on the Lull Mage when it enters. After that, he casts Incubation, looking at the top 5 cards of his library and putting a creature from among them into his hand, but unfortunately, he doesn't find one and has to put them all on the bottom of his deck. Bilal plays a Lava Claw Reaches, and then recasts Kalia, moving to combat and attacking me for 2 with his commander, triggering her and putting Demon of Loathing into play, hitting me for 9 total damage, and making me sacrifice a creature, which luckily I don't have. On Jason's turn, he casts Soul Warden, gaining a life whenever another creature enters the battlefield. This also triggers the Valkyrie, gaining him a life, and he then casts Leyline of Sanctity, giving himself Hexproof. He moves to combat, attacking Bilal for 5 with Aura, gaining 5 life. On my turn, I cast Rooftop Storm, allowing me to cast zombies for free, and thanks to Conspiracy, every creature in my deck is a zombie. This lets me cast Muldrifter, drawing 2 cards, and then I follow that up by casting Patrician Geist, giving my spirits plus 1 plus 1, and reducing the cost of spells I cast from the graveyard by 1. This also allows Jason to gain 2 life from his Soul Warden. On Sean's turn, he plays an island, and then recasts his commander Kumena, gaining Jason another life. On Bilal's turn, he plays a Grand Colosseum, and then casts Aurelia the War Leader, gaining Jason another life. He then attacks Jason for 7 and Sean for 5 with Kalia and Aurelia. This triggers Kalia, but Bilal has no cards in hand to put into play, and it also triggers Aurelia, untapping all his creatures and giving him an additional combat step after this one. They take the damage, and Jason is forced to sacrifice a creature, sacrificing Aura, and returning Fiend Hunter to play with his ability. This lets him exile the Demon of Loathing until the Hunter leaves play. In Bilal's second combat phase, he attacks Sean for 3 with Aurelia, but leaves Kalia back. On Jason's turn, he casts a Zulaport Cutthroat, draining each opponent for 1 whenever one of his creatures dies, and casts Cabal Archon, which can sacrifice a Cleric to make target player lose 2 life and gain Jason 2 life. This triggers his Clerics, gaining him a total of 3 life, and he attacks Bilal for 4 with the Valkyrie and me for 3 with the Fiend Hunter. I decide to block with my Muldrifter, killing the Elemental, and then Bilal takes 4 damage.
On my turn, I recast Gissa and Garolf, only having to pay the commander tax thanks to Rooftop Storm and Conspiracy, milling four cards, which are unfortunately all lands. This does, however, let me recast Muldrifter from the graveyard, drawing two cards. I then cast Displace, exiling Gissa and Garolf and Muldrifter, returning them to the battlefield, milling four more cards, drawing two, and gaining Jason two more life. This also resets my commander, allowing me to cast another spell from my graveyard. This time, I cast Eccentric Apprentice from my graveyard, venturing into the dungeon of the Mad Mage, gaining a life, and gaining Jason a life as well. After that, I play a Nefalia Drownyard as my land for turn. Then I cast Treasure Cruise, delving six to pay for it and drawing three cards. Finally, I cast Champion of Wits, drawing two more cards, discarding two more cards, and then finally passing the turn. On Sean's turn, he plays a Forest, and passes. Bilal casts Gisela Blade of Gold Knight, doubling the damage done to his opponents and their permanents, and halving the damage done to himself and his permanents. This lets him attack Jason for 20 with his flyers, triggering Aurelia, untapping his team and getting an additional combat step, however he doesn't attack a second time. Jason casts a Bishop of Rebirth, gaining 5 life, and on my turn I cast Otherworldly Gaze, looking at the top 3 cards of my library, putting all of them into the graveyard, which are a Secrets of the Key, Lord of the Forsaken, and Grey Merchant of Asphodel. I then flash back Otherworldly Gaze, again looking at the top 3 cards of my library, and putting them all into the graveyard again. This time it's Ominous Roost, Murderous Cut, and Master of Death. Once that resolves, I play an island, and then I decide to cast Grey Merchant of Asphodel from the graveyard. Before it can resolve, however, Sean casts a Beast Within to destroy my conspiracy and give me a 3-3 Beast Creature token. In response to that, I flash in Venser Shaper Savant to return Conspiracy to my hand, fizzling Sean's spell and gaining Jason a life. Then the Grey Merchant finally resolves, making each opponent lose 3 life since I have 3 Devotion to Black, and gaining me 9 life since that's the total life my opponents lost, while Jason gains an additional 1. I then recast Conspiracy, again naming Zombie when it enters, and cast Author of Shadows, exiling each opponent's graveyard and choosing Beast Within from among the cards exiled, allowing me to cast it at any time with mana of any color. Then at the end of turn, Sean cast River Herald's Boon to put a plus one plus one counter on Merfolk Skydiver and Kumena, and then activates Kumena, tapping three Merfolk to draw a card. On Sean's turn, he plays an island and cast Cultivate to search his library for two basic lands, putting one into play tapped and the other to hand. On Bilal's turn, he moves straight to combat, attacking me for 20 with all of his creatures, triggering Kalia to put Blinding Angel into play, also attacking me for 4 more damage, gaining Jason a life. This also triggers Aurelia, untapping all his creatures and giving him an additional combat step. I block Gisela and Aurelia, killing Muldrifter and Patrician Geist, taking 8 and being forced to skip my next combat step thanks to Blinding Angel. In his second combat step, Bilal attacks Sean for 14 with Gisela and Blinding Angel. Before the blocks, Sean casts a Merfolk Trickster, making Gisela lose all abilities until end of turn and gaining Jason a life. He then blocks Gisela with the Skydiver and activates Kumena to tap 3 Merfolk and draw a card before the damage. He then takes 2 and has to skip his next combat step. On Jason's turn, he casts Remorseful Cleric, gaining 2 life, and then sacrifices Remorseful Cleric to exile my graveyard, making each opponent lose a life while he gains yet another life. After that, he moves to combat, attacking Sean for 5 with Bishop of Rebirth, returning the Remorseful Cleric to play with its attack trigger, gaining another 2 life. Sean then blocks with Kumena, returning his commander to the command zone yet again. I play an island, and then cast Deadeye Navigator, soul bonding it to Grey Merchant when it enters. This means that I can pay 2 mana to exile either creature and return it to the battlefield under my control. I then activate it to trigger Grey Merchant's enter the battlefield trigger again, making each opponent lose 6 life while I gain 18. In response, 
Jason sacrifices Remorseful Cleric to Cabal Archon, making Sean lose 3 life, Bilal and I lose 1, and Jason gains 3. He then does the same with Fiend Hunter, making Sean lose another 3, Bilal and I lose 1, and Jason gains 3, knocking Sean out of the game, but preventing me from gaining 6 life. Then my initial Grey Merchant resolves, and I activate it three more times, resulting in me knocking Bilal out of the game, doing 20 damage to Jason thanks to him gaining life whenever Grey Merchant enters, and gaining a total of 36 life. After that, I cast River Kelpie, allowing me to draw a card whenever a permanent enters the battlefield from the graveyard, or anyone casts a spell from the graveyard, gaining Jason another life. Jason casts an Arcane Signet, and then attacks me with Bishop of Rebirth for 3, returning Fiend Hunter to play with the attack trigger, exiling Deadeye Navigator and gaining 4 life. I also draw a card with River Kelpie, and then block the Bishop with Gissa and Garolf, but Jason sacrifices it to Cabal Archon, making me lose 3 life while he gains 3. In his second main phase, he casts a Doomed Necromancer, gaining 3 more life. On my turn, I sacrifice Champion of Wits with High Market, gaining a life, and then I recast the Champion of Wits from the graveyard, drawing three cards and discarding two, gaining Jason another life. After that, I play an Island, and cast King Narfi's Betrayal, milling each player for four, and allowing me to exile a creature or planeswalker from each graveyard. This lets me exile Jason's Remorseful Cleric and my Solemn Simulacrum. After that, I flash back Dread Return, sacrificing Gissa and Karalf, Champion of Wits, and River Kelpie, which returns to the battlefield with a minus one minus one counter thanks to Persist. This allows me to return Laboratory Drudge to the battlefield from my graveyard and draw three cards with River Kelpie. After that resolves, I cast a Gravebreaker Lamia, allowing me to search my library and put a card into my graveyard. This allows me to put Archaeomancer into the graveyard, and then by recasting Gissa and Garolf, I'm able to mill four cards and cast Archaeomancer from the graveyard. Once I'm casting the Archaeomancer, I'm able to return Ghostly Flicker from my graveyard to my hand when it enters, drawing another card from the River Kelpie. At the end of turn, I draw a card with Laboratory Drudge, since I cast a spell from my graveyard this turn. On Jason's turn, he casts Veto, Thorn of the Dusk Rose, making it so that whenever he gains life, target opponent loses that much life. This gains him 4, so I lose 4. He then activates Doomed Necromancer, sacrificing it to return Bishop of Rebirth to play, and this results in me losing a total of 7 life, while Jason gains 6 and I draw a card. After that, he moves to combat, attacking me for 4, and I block with Eccentric Apprentice, killing my creature. At the end of turn, I flash in Shadowkin. In my upkeep, Shadowkin mills each player for 3, but I opt not to exile any of them. In my first main phase, I cast Ghostly Flicker, targeting Gravebreaker Lamia and Archaeomancer, exiling both of them and returning them to play. This returns Ghostly Flicker to my hand, and lets me search my library, putting Peregrine Drake into the graveyard. I can then cast Peregrine Drake with Gissa and Garolf, untapping 5 lands when it enters, and using it and Archaeomancer to cast Ghostly Flicker an infinite number of times and gain infinite mana. This will also be gaining Jason 2 life and making me lose 2 each time the loop happens, but I'm able to switch between Grey Merchant and Peregrine Drake, making Jason lose more life than he can gain, infinitely draining him out, winning me the game. Okay, so we had both of our gameplay videos for this week. They were both super sweet games. Um, I'm a little bit biased, obviously, because we did manage to take down both of them. Gissa and Grolf definitely proved their worth. Um, very powerful. I do think it's interesting, though, that in both games we actually won with the exact same combo, with one exception. In the first game we won with... Uh, Archaeomancer, Peregrine Drake, Grey Merchant, and Displace, and the second game we won with Archaeomancer, Peregrine Drake, Grey Merchant, and Ghostly Flicker. So 
arguably the exact same combo both times, which is not always how it's meant to go, but that is definitely like the easiest way to win out of all the things in our deck. It is very difficult to construct though, because it is a four card combo that needs to not really be interacted with to be able to win. So I do think that it showed its power, but I also think it showed a little bit of its weaknesses because if one of those combo pieces had been exiled, I'm not 100% sure what we would have done. I think we may have still been able to win, but it would have been a little bit difficult. And other than our deck, of course, I do think there were some highlights from everybody else's deck as well. George seemed very strong out of the gate, and he specifically mentioned at the end of the game, there was one time when I paid for his smothering tithe that if I hadn't, he would have been able to flash in his uh, changeling at the end of turn so he could have actually killed me on his turn. So let this be a lesson to everybody. Pay for smothering tithe if you can, because if you don't, it might kill you. And then Mike, of course, had uh, very unfortunate luck with his ad nauseum there, uh, hitting himself for nine. Again, he mentioned that his total mana value for his deck was very low, so the nine was very, very unlucky, but it was pretty funny, I'm not going to lie. We all got a pretty good laugh out of it, so I'm glad to see that he had a sense of humor, even after knocking himself out. And then in the second game... I was kind of right when I said that Bilal was probably going to be a massive threat because he was swinging for 15, 20 damage every single time once he got Gisela on board was a very big threat. I think that Sean could have been a much bigger threat if he'd been able to keep his commander. Unfortunately, it kind of kept dying on him and he wasn't able to draw as many cards and make his creatures as big as he wanted. And then Jason, definitely a bigger threat than anticipated even in the early game. I knew that later on he would be a bit of a problem, but I didn't anticipate him gaining so much life so quickly and then pumping up his team with the Valkyrie. So being able to kill him at the end was very lucky because if he had some way to interact or to gain more life than I could do in terms of damage, then we just couldn't have gotten there. So all the pieces just kind of fell in for us, luckily, but I do think that everybody else had phenomenal decks and put up a great game so very happy to be involved in that but i do think that is where we will wrap up our video for today i know it's been a bit of a long one with the two separate uh, gameplay videos but let me know what you think let me know if you would like to see the two gameplays return more often i can't promise they'll be every week but if they can be more often that would be great or if you just want to go back to one that's fine too so let me know what you think in the comments below as I mentioned before, please do like and subscribe. It helps out quite a bit. But with all that being said, I will see you all on the other side of the Dungeon Learner's Guide.